Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Although this 50-year-old patient is in excellent systemic health, she does have periodontal disease, which involves her bicuspid and molar teeth. As indicated on this chart, there are deep periodontal pockets in the molar and second bicuspid regions. There are also trifurcation involvements of the molars from the lingual aspect. Five to six millimeter pockets are present at the mesial and distal aspects of the cuspid. Some of the pockets extend to the mucogingival line, but the gingival crevices are of normal depth around the lateral and central incisors. Rentgenograms show advanced bone loss, which involves the trifurcation of the second and first molars. There is a four to five millimeter bone loss at the distal and mesial aspect of the bicuspid and at the distal aspect of the cuspid. The pockets are shallow on the buccal side of the cuspid, bicuspid, and first molar. However, the interproximal pockets between the molars extend beyond the attached gingiva. The interproximal pockets are five to six millimeters deep. No bifurcation involvement of the first bicuspid or between the buccal roots of the molars. The interproximal palatal pockets between the molars are five to seven millimeters deep. They're shallower for the bicuspid. Evidence of trifurcation involvement on the mesial and distal lingual aspects of the first molar when these areas are probed with a number 17 explorer. The palatal incision has been outlined. The exaggerated scalloping effect around the molars will permit the buccal and lingual flaps to be drawn together interproximally. Also note the outline for the distal wedge incision. The buccal incision is outlined one half millimeter to one millimeter from the free gingival margin to assure complete removal of the epithelial lining in the buccal crevices. Note the vertical releasing incision between the cuspid and lateral incisor. Iodine lotion is applied to the pockets and the mucosal membranes to minimize the bacterial flora in the field of surgery. buccal incision is started with a Bard Parker 12B blade. From the distal aspect of the second bicuspid, however, a Bard Parker number 11 knife is able to provide better accessibility.
vertical incision is made between the cuspid and lateral incisor. A full thickness mucoperiosteal flap is reflected from the bone to a depth of three to four millimeters. A number seven wax instrument or Bennett elevator as shown here may be used for this purpose. tissues in the surgical field are swabbed with iodine lotion, which is also placed in the gingival crevices. The palatal incision is started with a Bard Parker 12B blade. Notice the exaggerated scalloping of the flap in the molar area. The flap is cut thin to facilitate its adaptation after the surgery. palatal incision for the second bicuspid is made with an Orban knife. Then the Bard Parker number 12B knife is used for the incision on the mesial aspect of the bicuspid and cuspid. releasing palatal incision is made between the cuspid and the lateral incisor. The palatal flap is raised with a mucoperiosteal elevator. In this instance, a Bennett type is used. The flap is elevated four to six millimeters in order to provide access and good flap adaptation. With an Orban knife, the cervical collar of tissue is cut loose from the teeth. A Bard Parker number 11 blade is used for the same purpose on the buckle side. This incision extends from the bottom of the pocket to the alveolar crest. The buccal and interproximal collar of tissues is cut loose with a small, narrow Orban knife. Note how the flap is pushed up so the knife can be positioned on the alveolar crest. Similar interproximal incision is made on the palatal side. The cervical collar of tissue is removed with curettes. is a convenient instrument to grasp and remove the excised wedge of tissue behind the second molar. The excised buccal tissues are treated the same as the palatal tissues.
Now the flap has been raised about four to five millimeters apically in order to expose the buckle ledge of bone. The bone must not be allowed to become dry. All soft tissues over the bone should be removed with curettes. The flap and blood should be allowed to cover the bone as much as possible during this procedure in order to keep the surface bone alive. used for planing the roots. The rough cemento enamel junction is smoothed with periodontal files. These instruments also remove gross roughness on the root surface. separate files for the mesial and distal surfaces. After the files have been used, the root surfaces are planed with curettes until they are completely smooth. are also used to smooth the cemento enamel junction on the buccal aspects of the teeth. The filing should be followed by a root planing with curette. Interproximal debridement of tissue tag must be thorough and complete. files are again used to smooth the cemento enamel junction and gross roughness on the root surfaces. Separate files are used for the mesial and distal root surfaces. A meticulous root planing with curettes should follow the use of the files. The palatal flap is reflected to show the alveolar crest and the interproximal areas. A tag of interproximal soft tissue can be observed between the first molar and the bicuspid. This tissue is excised with an Orban knife. A number 17 explorer is used to check the smoothness of the root surfaces and the beginning trifurcation involvement on the first molar. This area should be well cleaned out. The wound is inspected for any residual tags of soft tissue, calculus, or softened tooth structure. A bone chisel is used to remove a protruding ledge of the alveolar process on the buccal side. This sharp ledge would interfere with good flap adaptation following surgery. Only the protruding part is removed. The palatal flap is repositioned to check its adaptation. It appears to be too thick on the palatal aspect of the second bicuspid. Therefore, a Bard Parker 12B knife is used to thin the flap from the periosteal side by scraping off the inner surface tissues. The 
flap adaptation is now improved. Interproximal sutures have been placed to secure the flap in position. Note the thin margins of the flap on the palatal aspect of the first molar. The sutures are tied on the buccal side. The adaptation of the interdental tissue is good. One suture is used to approximate the tissues distal to the second molar. Note the marked gingival recession following the removal of the undermined wedge. Acromycin ointment is placed over the sutures in the interproximal areas to prevent infection. Surgical dressing is then applied over the area of surgery. Here we can see the pack from the palatal aspect. The palatal dressing also covers the area of surgery. The sutures were removed one week after surgery. At the end of two weeks, healing appears to be complete. The gingival crevices are shallow and gentle probing does not produce any bleeding. tissues are also well healed and the gingival crevices are shallow. There is still a slight redness of the free gingival margin. The distal wedge area has healed completely with a desired gingival recession for the elimination of the distal pocket. After six months, there has been partial regeneration of tissues in the interproximal areas. The crevices are still within normal limits. No bleeding is produced by gentle probing. The palatal gingival contour is good and the tissues have a healthy appearance. The residual pocket depth on the mesiolingual and distal lingual aspect of the first molar is only two millimeters. The trifurcation areas on number 14 cannot be probed with a number 17 explorer, indicating that some reattachment may have occurred in this region. The reverse bevel flap procedure has been successfully employed to eliminate the periodontal pathology in this patient. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.